Hey, gathering. Whoa, hot mic, hot mic. Good to be with you. It's Easter part two. Today is Orthodox Easter, and we Congregationalists need to be right. So we're not sure if last Sunday was Easter or this Sunday. So since there's a debate, we'll do both. Why not? Orthodox Easter. So happy Easter, everyone. We are in Easter Eastertide. It is April 16th, 2023. Lots of fun things happening. The gathering band is here in full strength, looking good, ready to rock out for us as we worship together. But before we do that, let's put a hand over our heart. We can drop our shoulders away from our ears. Maybe close your eyes. Get that chin up. You're happy to be here. You're proud to be the gathering. It's good to be here at the 9 o'clock. Take a deep breath in together and out. You didn't know you were breathing that shallow, didn't you? One more breath in and out with a sigh. <sighs> it's our first prayer together, a prayer of God's spirit. God's ruach, which hovered over the still waters, is within and among us even now. So welcome, church. Let's raise a sign of peace to one another. Those who are joining us live stream, those who are here live, wherever you are in space and time, let us say, hey, neighbor. Hey, neighbor. Glad to see you. Glad to see you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Let us begin.
let's sing this as a prayer. Holy, you are holy, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are holy. First scripture is Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do, do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And now John chapter 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his sides. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelves, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the mark. He said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Joseph, Thomas was with them. Although the Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach your ha out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. These are written so that you may believe. This next song... Um, I think I'd like to have a stand for this. We've sort of appropriated a military kind of sound to it. And it's not that we want to militarize Christianity, but I think we do want to stand up in faith, in strength and confidence. Right. 
Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest crowd and storm what heights of love what depths of Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. I love the story of Doubting Thomas, but that line stood out for me, maybe for the first time. I really not had thought much about it. But this line is so important, it ends the Gospel of John. John 21, 25 says, But there are also many other things Jesus did, and if every one of them were written down, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that could be written. And we are still writing books. It's a heck of a way to end the gospel, the account of Jesus, the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the anointed one of God, the second person of the Trinity, our Lord and Savior. It ends with the evangelist John saying, Pastor Luke paraphrased, yeah, he did other stuff. I think this phrase has a lot to say about our life and faith. Too much to say in a single sermon, so I'll try to break it down in three things. First, we'll talk about the role of Scripture in our life of faith. Second, we'll talk about the non-hierarchy of discipleship. <laughs> That's a fun phrase. The non-hierarchy of discipleship. You'll understand it later. And third, revelation. So first things first, the role of Scripture. The phrase, he did other stuff too, 
completely obliterates any debate around the authority of Scripture. Last week, I spent a lot of time on social media during my isolation and quarantine, and I saw a lot of ads urging people to go to a Bible-believing church for Easter. Church? Gathering? I hate that phrase. Bible-believing. All churches are Bible-believing, but some aren't Bible-worshipping. That's often a code. Bible-believing is code for Bible-worshipping. Claims of inerrancy aren't biblical. It is nowhere in the text. First Timothy says all scripture is inspired. And by the way, it was written before the canon was finalized. That's a whole other ball of wax. We'll get there on a Bible study. But inerrancy, infallibility is not bi biblical. The Bible never claims that for itself. And there's an impulse within Christianity to worship the Bible. And that's the easy way out. It's a quotable. It doesn't change. You just stick with the King James 1648 edition. All the other ones are heretics, by the way. No, not at all. Not at all. The study of Scripture is vital to our life of faith. And St. Augustine says, we cannot neglect the critical or devotional readings of Scripture. We must do both. We must do both. The critical study of Scripture means to challenge the text, to run it through the ringer of the critical methods of biblical interpretation, like textual, socio-historic, and other critical methods. We use the various lenses of interpretation, like a feminist reading, a queer reading, a process theology reading, a neo-orthodox reading, to suss out what this scripture means to us. We refine it, break it down, and figure out what truth still remains for us today. We need to do that, and the critical methods get us there but we cannot neglect the devotional reading either. That means just open up the book and see what's written there. And just enjoy it. Savor it. Roll it around on your tongue. See how it tastes. Say it out loud. Stand up and read it. Go by a window and read it. Go in a closet and read it. There's many ways to do it. Savor it. Try it out. You feel like, oh, the Bible's boring. Well, read Psalm 19 outside. It's, going to, it's a whole different take. A whole different take when you're outside reading Psalm 19 than when you're in an air-conditioned building. We cannot neglect either one. But it seems that there are a choice to be made. There's churches like ours who maybe rely on the critical methods so much that we can't tell if we like faith or not, because we're always critique, critique, critique. But the other churches also just accept everything blind. And that's not a good way either. We need a mix, critical and devotional. A love that is transparent and apparent, and also a challenge to us. The scripture is challenging in and of itself, and we can challenge it back too. And Jesus did other stuff too, is permission to challenge it. It's a call to stay humble. Scripture can't capture God. If scripture knows that it can't, why, think we, why do we think it does? Scripture can't relate all the great things Jesus did while he was with us, and the truth of scripture and its power lies in its ability to make the presence of God in Christ tangible to us. Our stories are sacred not because they're sacred in and of themselves. They're sacred because they point beyond themselves into a living relationship with God. Think of Scripture like a diving board as you're jumping into the deep end. Some are lower. Some are easier readings. Like, I, I think the Gospels. That's the, low, that's the low diving board. But Leviticus, that's a high diving board. That's a high dive. That's Olympic-level high dive. That's hard for me to find God there. So I need someone like Rob Bell in Blood, Guts, and Fire, his audio book that's 12 hours long, to help me understand Leviticus. That's a higher dive for me. He got me there. Well, that's a higher dive. Gospels are a lower dive to launch me into the deep end of the pool of the living water of Christ, where I have to swim where I have to see how the water is, where I'm caught up in the fullness of God, surrounded by the love of God. Which brings me to my second point. So if Scripture points beyond itself and launches us into a living relationship with God, then that makes us exactly the same as any other disciple. Wait a second. Exactly the same? Yes, exactly the same. Here's why. We have made discipleship a hierarchy important people at the top, then pastors, and then you. Actually, UCC, it's you guys, and then council, and then pastors, maybe somewhere in there. 
there's still a hierarchy. That's us doing that. When you read the scriptures today, Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't show up and be like, now Thomas, shame, shame, shame. Doesn't happen. Doesn't happen. We treat Thomas as a second class disciple. Don't be a doubting Thomas. That's what tradition says. We've all heard that phrase, haven't we? Absolutely. I'm telling you, be a doubting Thomas. He's not shamed. He should have been able to believe the story that his friends were telling him or the testimony of Mary. But if we're honest, we don't really believe it. It's an incredible story. He was dead and he got up. How does that work? We have questions, don't we? I'm interested, what is the science behind the resurrection? How did he do it? Give me the particulars. What happened on Saturday? Did he wake up and just chilled? Just for the clergy's sake to give us a break a holy week? That's what Dan thought. I mean, it'd be crazy if we go like Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then do the fourth services Sunday. I, ugh, what we do do kills me. I wouldn't even hear for half of it. So it's crazy. Like, what is up with this? Scripture doesn't care. Scripture doesn't care. Three quarters of the way through last week's sermon, Jesus shows up. He just shows up. We think he's the gardener. The particularities of the resurrection are not even mentioned in Scripture, but the principle is all around us. New life is blooming. We threw death and shame and fear and torture and the cross at God. And God responds in love each and every time. Each and every time. That's how you know Jesus is God, because he doesn't act like you and me. When you come at me with a cross, I give you a cross back. An eye for an eye. That's, that's how we often do. Or an eye, and I'll take both of your eyes. Often we do that. But God takes the cross and responds with grace, forgiveness, and exactly what we need to believe. Say, put your hands here. Put them in the mark. That's what you needed, right, Thomas? You didn't think I heard. I heard. And here's what you need. And Thomas, it doesn't say if he did it, but he says, my Lord and my God. Which is the statement the Gospel of John has been working up to since chapter 1. No other disciple says that. Peter says, you're the Messiah. Mary Magdalene says, you're the Messiah. That's different than my Lord and my God. The Jewish idea of, this, of Messiah didn't have any deity connotation with it. Chosen by God, but not God. Thomas says, my Lord, Messiah, and my God, Theosis, Trinity, second nature, two natures of Christ. Do you see it? So for us, here, we who doubt, we who deny, we who run away, we who respond in cross and not grace are invited back to the table time and time again by Christ. Time and time again, in this living, dynamic relationship, we are exactly the same as Peter. We are exactly the same as Mary. Well, maybe not Mary. She's called Magdala, the Great, the Tower. Maybe Wendy, the Tower. We could try that on Wendy. I like that. I, no? Okay. Stay humble. I like it. I like it. But Jesus responds with grace time and time again to the first century of disciples. Give them what they need to believe and does so with us. Does so with us. He's still doing that now. When I was in Egypt in my cross-cultural trip, I could tell my friend, we were on the bus just going through the expanse, vast nothingness of the Sinai Peninsula. We're heading back from being on Mount Sinai. We're driving back. I think we're going to Cairo. And there's just nothing. And I see my friend is just weeping like a crazy person right across the way. I'm like, what? What is happening with Kathy? So I wait, and I notice, and she notices that I notice, but she's going through something. So she invites me over, and she's like, Luke, I just saw Jesus. So my brain automatically, that's devotional, and I switch over to critical right away because Kathy is Unitarian Universalist. She's a weird new age, let's dance with crystals and burn sage in your house to clear out the evil spirits. That's Kathy. I love Kathy. I love the UUs. Not my cup of tea. They read tea leaves. No, they don't. That's something else. I'm off the rails here. Anyway, 
you use. You don't need Jesus. You're doing fine without him. Because I knew what Jesus demands. I know what the life of discipleship demands. And here she is crying. I saw Jesus. I said yes to him. That's really great, Kathy. Are you sure? She's like, Pfft. So she goes and she tells the other people and she's hugged and there's this big cry fest on the bus and everybody's celebrating and everything. Three hours later, and we're still on the same bus, by the way, she comes back to me. She's like, Luke, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the question that you asked. You were the only one to ask it. Because I know that the resurrected Christ still bore the scars of the crucifixion. There is pain involved. This is counter to the way I've been living my life from this point on is going to be different. And you asked the right question, and my answer is still yes. And then we cried, and then we hugged. And there was the devotional part. The critical and the devotional. Are you sure? And that's what Kathy needed to believe. She needed to see Christ, to see his response. I only got a voice from the back seat saying, feed my sheep in an F-150. Because that's what I needed to believe. If I saw Jesus, I'd be like, really, Lyndon? That's what you think he looks like? And I would doubt for like five more years just based on that one vision. Jesus like, no, Lyndon needs the voice. Kathy needs the full Monty. That's what needs to happen just as I love Sam and Eve differently, God loves us differently, yet the same. We just say the Our Father. We say God is a heavenly parent. God is a, like a mother hen that gathers us like chicks who loves us the same, but differently. I jump in front of a car for Eve or Sam. I stop a bullet with my body for them. I do anything for them. I love them the same, but I different, but differently. I listen with Taylor Swift with Eve. She's through the Taylor Swift. I love Taylor Swift. There's like four artists I own every album of. Taylor Swift's one of them. She has chosen well. But to hear every single remix on YouTube of Taylor Swift is a lot. But I sit there with her. I don't have to do that with Sam. With Sam, we're starting the Dino Scouts. These little things, it's kind of like he didn't want to necessarily continue on with Boy Scouts. Okay, so we developed our own thing to do. So we're doing, going to do that together. Things he wants to do, like learning paper mache with Sam. Don't need to do that with Eve. So I love them the same, but differently, just like God loves us the same, yet differently. Do you need to see the scars? Put your hand in here in the side. Do you? Or do you? Ask and you shall receive. Knock and the door will be open for you. Be clear what you need to believe. And God will provide. Christ will provide. The Spirit will confirm. I used to be a little jealous of people. So I saw Jesus. I had this encounter. Are they better than me? No, they just needed that. I just needed the voice saying, feed my sheep from the backseat of an F-150. What do you need? What's your story? How did you come to believe? Was it one thing, or was it a whole bunch of little confirmations over time? You don't need just one explosive event. You can have a really great worship service and just a really meaningful communion. If that's what you need, ask, and it will be provided. So, my friends, Scripture points beyond itself and launches us into a living relationship with God who loves us the same yet differently. And the final point, revelation. John does not write his gospel as a historical document. Let me say that again. I don't think it's sunk in yet. John does not write his gospel as a historical document. That blows our modern mindset apart. We are so obsessed with accuracy and documenting. We are obsessed with historical accuracy. We want a photo of our dinner on Instagram so that archaeologists a thousand years from now can know what we had for Easter dinner on 2011. 
John is not concerned with any of that. He is not writing in that genre. John is not writing a rule book of faith. John is not ever claiming to be a centralized account to wield authority. John is a testimony. John is a mystic writing an epic love poem to Jesus. The good news according to John is an epic love poem to Jesus who is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't like that metaphor? He's the living water. You don't like that metaphor? He's the living bread. You don't like that metaphor? He's the true vine. You don't like that one? Try the gate. You don't like that one? He's the good shepherd. And many other things not written in his book. He is like a machine gun of metaphors just coming at you constantly, calling back Leviticus and the Psalms and Psalm 23 and all the Deuteronomy laws and Moses. And here it all is. If you can't see your own tradition and how Christ is the fulfillment of it through John, you're reading it wrong. It's everywhere. It's a testimony. It's not an end-all, be-all. And it states it twice before ending his testimony. He did other stuff too. Not recorded here. I didn't get all of it. So that gives us Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That gives us openings to their testament. That gives us the testimonies of Paul and the epistles. That gives us those. This gospel is way more open-handed. Lukeism. That's why I'm well-named. Luke says, I am the definitive account. You will listen to me. Sorry, church. The name should have tipped you off. But John, way more open-handed, which means Scripture... It's like a diving board into the living relationship with God and that there's no hierarchy. That means your revelation matters just as much as this guy speaking his from the pulpit or telling you about Kathy back in Egypt in 2009. See the historical accuracy? That's called the critical methods. But the devotional is feel that. Know it. Your testimony, your voice matters. Now, there's much more to say about all this. It's heavy stuff. It's a lot. And I'm sure you have a lot to say as well. You get to say, let's talk about it in the Bible study tomorrow. We've got two chances, two and six. Come on out. Let's talk. Let's continue the conversation. Let's go take a coffee or wrecking crew beer. I'm, I'm here for all of it. I want to hear your story, your revelation. Because that's the three points that today's scripture, I think, tells us. The role of Scripture is to point us into a living relationship with God. It is not an end of itself. Second, the non-hierarchy of discipleship means God loves us the same as the first generation, yet differently given our context. And finally, Christ will give us the revelation we need to believe. And that is good news for all people, because we can add our testimony to the giants of faith. Our voice matters. Our prayers, our acts of love matter. All this adds to the beloved community of God, the God who can't love us anymore and refuses to love us any less. Thanks be to God, our Christ, our Spirit, one God forevermore. Amen. So what you're saying, Pastor, is this table is just the same as the table in the first century on that Passover meal. Yes. And that's just not me saying it. That's our tradition saying that. And that's just our tradition. That's every tradition who says that this is a sacrament, which is all of them but the Quakers. And they're fine, too. We like <laughs> All of them, even though we say, you know, the Catholics believe this is actually, this bread becomes the actual body. Or our Lutherans, who's like, oh, we don't know about that, that, but the Spirit is with the bread. Or like us, who's like, it's a sign and symbol. We all call it sacrament. We all say sacred. We all make the claim that this table brings us back to the first table. So here, church, on the night he was given up, he took the bread, he blessed it, and broke it, and said, this is my body, broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup, he blessed it, and poured it, saying, this is the cup of my blood, 
blood of the new and everlasting covenant has been shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do so in remembrance of me. And so we pray. Christ, we thank you for this table. We thank you that you've decided to invite us and host us here. For the bread that is your body broken for us, for the blood and love you poured out upon us, you do not respond with violence as we do. But you encourage us, just as we heard in today's sacred story, forgive the sins. For any sin that you hold on to, you will retain. Let us shed all sin as you shed all sin from us. You forgave us totally and fully. And you invite us still. Thanks be to you, our father, our mother, our parent, who loves us the same, yet differently. Amen. Friends, come forward, dip the bread in the cup. Taste and see the Lord is good, for all has been made ready. Thanks be to God. Paraphrase Luke. If you're reading the scripture and nothing changes, you're reading it wrong. Rise, 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 rise,
Christ, take your place. Be enthroned on our praise to rise in the kings, holy God, as we sing. Arise, take your place. Be enthroned on our praise to rise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing. Arise, 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 arise. Let us pray. Christ, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Savior, for your table, for this gathering, for our friends here that we may not have met without your church. Thank you for the call to be your church together, to arise in your name, to be your promise to the hurting world, to be your body reaching out with health, healing, and wholeness. Thank you, Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You want announcements? Ask and you shall receive. Look, I'll give you what you need, guys. It's like the sermon, like I believed it. Uh, in the back of our uh, sanctuary, the back of Fellowship Hall, we have an announcement coming through the door with Darlene. <laughs> That's right. Good morning. I am here for the ladies' tea. Get the hat. Um, the ladies' tea is coming up Saturday, May 20th, from 1130 to 130. And we will have scones, tea sandwiches, soups, fresh fruit, yummy sweets will all be served. And tickets go on sale today in the East Room for $10 for adults and $5 for girls under the age of 10. Our program this year is presented by Vicki Miller, and it's called All the Tea in China. You'll learn about the tea that's grown and harvested in the mountain regions of China, plus sample and taste different uh, various teas. Secondly, we have our quilts that are on display in the East Room, and they are made by the hands of Sue Dean. So please come over and take a look. They're beautiful. We're trying to raise money for high chairs and booster seats for Fellowship Hall. And these p tickets can be purchased for $2 each and 6 for 10 and they will be draw the raffle will be drawn at the ladies' tea, but you don't have to be present. So please come and see our quilts and sign up for the ladies' tea. Thank you. Today is a, is a busy one. I don't think I'll see my house till about 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, we have the Prince of Peace spaghetti lunch that benefits Operation Homes. So if you're hungry, that would be a great place to go have brunch on 18, our friends at Prince of Peace. We also have here on the square the pinwheel walk. There's also a run happening, I see out there. So a lot of things happening today. Pinwheel walk is for the Children's Center, an awareness of domestic violence and the 523 cases that are here in the county. So blessings to the work and the awareness that we are raised. You can see those pinwheels that we've sponsored right around our hobby horse sign. So thank you, church, for being part of that. We've also uh, won an award church, you have won an award for your faithfulness to United Church Homes. This award is called the Diakony Award for the Chapel Hill community. It'll be presented to us on August 22nd at 2 p.m. for your long faithfulness in the same direction, supporting with your funds United Church Homes and care for our elders. Over uh, the last 25 years, it is estimated that we have raised over $50,000 United Church Homes. You are well deserving of the ward, and I am excited uh, to 
accept it on our behalf. So thank you, church. And finally, tomorrow is uh, Monday, and we have our religion and science Bible study. Uh, it's a book based on the book called Saving Darwin by Carl Geberson. Uh, you don't need to read that book, but if you've ever wondered, like, how can I love science and love faith, you're in the right denomination. Here's how we do it. We'll tell you all about it and even tackle some of the myths of science and religion, like how Gal Galileo wasn't persecuted for believing the earth was round. That's a whole other story, and we'll talk about it in this series. Hope you'll come out. Those are the announcements that I have. Any questions gathering? Yeah, absolutely. All right. <laughs> oh, my. Dan's cataract on Tuesday. The in crowd only. The in crowd. Dan's, Dan's cataract. So for Sarah, expecting her first child, but has Lyme disease and the complications that go with that, a friend of Vicki Marty, whose flowers here on our communion table are in her honor and from her shower. Dan, Dan, the fix-it man. That's, that makes, that fits. The title fits, wear it. All right, friends, thank you. I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, my mother's father was a UCC pastor and spent time, his final years, in a United Church home. Thank you, church. And he probably wouldn't understand this next song, at least not the way we do it, because I was going to ask, what do you need? Luke asked it. But what I need is a band that what, won't let go of rehearsing a song until maybe it comes up in a Green Day version. Salute to Luke and the punk series. Let's stand and sing this. Feel free to bounce and jump and dance if you want. No 
one No name can rise above you, Lord One hope, one light will shine forevermore Your kingdom in heaven and on earth Your children stand to sing of your great word you died, you said in three days you would rise, you did, you're alive. You rule, you reign, you said you're coming back again, I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. You live, you die, you said in three days you would rise, you did, you're alive. You rule, you reign, you said you're coming back again, I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. benediction like we mean it. We believe the resurrecting power of Christ cannot be overcome by evil, but persists in all collective efforts to make life flourish in the midst of destruction, to birth beauty in places of death, and to tend gently the aches of this world. We profess the transforming power of love. We profess that justice is a form of love. We profess that we are still growing into the mystery. May whatever you have planned today be a break from your busyness and all that would take away from your life. For Christ, For Christ came, came to bring life and life abundantly. abundantly. Thanks, Thanks be to our God, God giver of life and conqueror of, of death. death. Having been blessed by Mary's good news of the resurrection, be a blessing today. Go, for this service has ended. And our, our service, service now, now begins. begins. Amen. You live, you die, you said in three days you would rise, you did. You're alive. You rule. Said you're coming back again. I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. You live, you die. You said in three days you would rise. You did. You're alive. You rule. Said you're coming back again. I know you will, and all the earth will sing your praises. 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 <laughs>